Thank you very much for being here with us. I think the men on the panel need no introduction whatsoever. They have been enlightening us for years together. Let's put our hands together for the first panel as we look forward to hearing from the masters themselves. <clears throat> so the, the theme of the panel discussion today is riding the bull, uh, surviving the bear, and where we are right now. Let's get started. Let's set the ball rolling first with a, with a take from the author, one of the authors as well, as to how this whole experience was interacting with these gentlemen. And let's say if you were to put it in a nutshell, uh, you know, your insight, your learning, what would that be? Actually, we have put a whole chapter about our learnings at the end of the book. Uh, there are quite a few to enumerate here. But uh, to take a few, one is about being bullish as far as India is concerned to be investing for the long term. Because otherwise, at the first problem, whether it is a political thing or from an economic standpoint or a market cycle standpoint, one tries to time the market and it doesn't work. Major wealth is created when you are invested over a cycle. It's very simple, I means we have heard it so many times, but until you inculcate it, it doesn't work. So that's one. Another is in terms of how you look at stocks. So you have a limited time, but what are the stocks or what are the key things to focus on, like growth, ROE, free cash flows, capital allocation. So if you focus on four or five key metrics, it becomes relatively easier to sort of look at the whole universe and figure out what you, what would do well over the next four or five years. Okay, we will talk a lot about some of these concepts as we go forward. Uh, let's also look at the theme itself, uh, since that's what we are here to discuss. Uh, Mr. Ayer, first of all, riding the bull, surviving the bear, and where we are right now. Let's answer that last bit of the question from what, what you, you can sort of derive out of it. We're definitely not in a bear market now. Um, if you look at what happened in the last week itself, you had an RBI governor resigning, you had the BJP losing the elections, and uh, you had a new RBI governor people are not sure about, and still the market went up. So I would say we are in the middle of a bull market. What phase of the bull market, I don't know, but we are in a bull market. Ramdev sir, you agree? Yeah, kind of. This is a very uh, different kind of bull market, but I still call it bull market uh, because there's no earnings growth, and yet markets are going up. So it's an earnings-less kind of a bull market where you're stretching the same stocks, 30p, 40p, 70p, but it's a bull market, yeah. Does that worry you? Yeah, I like, uh, it doesn't excite me uh, because uh, you, uh, the fun is to buy cheap stocks and lots of them. But today, wherever you go after do doing the book, after doing the screener and everything, and when you reach there, you realize that you are the last guy to reach there. Already 100 guys are there. So I think it's a very deeply researched market and uh, fully, fully, uh, I would say, priced in bulk of the stuff uh, where I could reach so far. So kind of uh, not that exciting. Not that exciting. All right, Hiran, opening thoughts. Where are we? Uh, <clears throat> I certainly feel, uh, feel that we are in the midst of an uptrend. Uh, you know, to me, uh, I think 2018 second half was very much like 2013 second half, right? I mean, you had a few macro headwinds back then. Uh, I remember Mr. Chidambaram was brought in as the finance minister, and Rajan came as the RBI governor. The rupee depreciated by 20 plus percent. Small and mid cap stocks corrected very sharply. There was elections in six months. So very similar setup in 2018. Uh, you know, you had the oil prices going up, currency coming down, worries about Fed increasing rates. Uh, you had, on top of that, you had the ILNFS problem. So you had a perfect storm in August, September. And usually a perfect storm is where the bottom is really made when there is no visibility and people are scared. And now there is, there is election six months down the line. So such similarity, and I tell investors that, you know, history is a great lesson. Whoever invested in the second half of 2013 was laughing all the way to the bank in 14, 15, 16, 17. The only difference I feel, as uh, Ramdev rightly mentioned, that in 2013, markets were incredibly cheap. This time around, markets are not that cheap, right? So it's that much more difficult. Uh, but as investors, as long-term investors, you should always welcome a crisis because at least now I think, if nothing else, a crisis is what will give us an opportunity to pick a few stocks. And that's what happened in August, September. 
But this crisis hasn't been shaved off over like 10 percent from the top. I mean, for this year, despite all the ups and downs and all the events that you gentlemen touched upon, uh, we're still actually up in positive territory for the calendar year and for you know the, the 12 months. So, Mr. Ayer, your thoughts then on uh, then if this is indeed a bull market and prices aren't correcting as much as you perhaps like them to, how do you make money? Actually, prices have corrected. I mean, if you look at what happened to the mid cap um, about a uh, little less than a year back, uh, they've corrected a lot. And uh, if you look at the overall market itself, it's gone down by 20%. Um, it can happen in the middle of a bull market that leadership changes. And I think that's what is happening. So some of the stocks which really led the bull market in the last two, three uh, years have been are very, very expensive. I mean, so, but I think there are other companies which have been ignored which are doing well. So I, I don't see the market overall might look va overvalued in terms of the index itself. But I think there is enough pockets of value inside the market. Since we are all already on the, the valuation subject um, and, and argument, uh, this whole classic debate between buy growth at any price or buy growth at a reasonable price, but then what is reasonable? I mean, how do you evaluate the sustainability of that growth? How do you negotiate some of uh, these issues? Um, Ramdev, you want to take that? Yeah, so in valuation is a large subject. and. Uh, you know, uh, particularly this kind of time, as I said, it's not that exciting because all the stocks where there is a longevity of growth and uh, stability of the uh, return, I mean, those stocks are kind of more than fairly valued. So, uh, I mean, as you said, growth at any price. Of course, in investing, if you buy at any price, you're not going to make money. And or you're going to make less than even fixed income money. Like if you make uh, to, uh, I mean, we have seen this wealth question study is only about valuation. So there we have seen if you buy at three times growth, so if growth is about, say, 20%, you buy at more than 60p multiple, your returns are not going to be as much as even the market. You will underperform the market, however good a stock you buy. So if that is so, you can decide. So what is going to happen if you, if you chase this uh, highly valued companies in your portfolio? Because they, they look very good. They, uh, your portfolio looks very decorated. You feel very comfortable. But uh, I'm quite sure after five years, the return from the same stocks in the portfolio would be, say, if market has done 10, 11 percent, you'll do about 8, 9 percent. You know, yeah. so that kind of risk is there. So if you want to really make uh, 15, 20 percent, you have to make that extra effort, find those stocks where something you know which market doesn't know. So let me ask the panel, in the current market context, uh, pockets which are well known, overvalued, whether you would still have comfort if you were buying fresh. I'm talking about the, the new people who are in. So for instance, consumer. I mean, something like Lever, some of its peers, and things which are trading at 60, 70 times, would you have comfort? No, as I said, you might have comfort in the sense that you won't lose money there, but uh, you might end up at, after five years not making any money in the stock or not a lot of money. Um, so, you know, if you're going to sacrifice return for safety, uh, you might as well buy bonds. So, Ramdev, sir, if one were to force you to buy something that is anyway expensive and you know it's not at, at your price, in the current market, what would that overvalued pocket be that you would still go ahead and you know put put something on? It's not that there is no opportunity. There is opportunity, but it's not staring at you. Like, uh, uh, see, typically uh, the the fun in last 25, 30 years has been that you could get enough stocks to double your money in three years. I mean, that used to be my formula. That uh, look at the stock when you hit the opportunity, you are looking at a doubler. Later on, either it turns out to be a dud or it turns out to be ten times. That's a. But when you start. There was a clearly a case where business was reasonable, management was reasonable, growing rapidly, and herbal at 15, 17 p multiple or 12 p multiple. That kind of opportunity is not there right now. But still, I mean, if you want to make, so obviously, instead of 25 percent, I am willing to take less than 20 percent, 18 percent, 17 percent kind of return. I, I mean, if the, see, what is going to happen is that you keep buying what you like and what is right. Say, I, we call it QGLP. Quality stocks we keep buying, growth stock we keep buying. That I'm not going to compromise. In fact, I'm willing to compromise lower returns. Somewhere along the line, what will happen is the Indian economy, which is slow right now, will pick up steam. And it will surprise everybody. It's like we don't know when it happens. Like in 2003, we thought that we are in wrong profession. And then what was knocking the door was the history's biggest bull market, 2003 to 2008. Yeah. So we don't know what is in out there. Will it be because of the liquidity? Will it be because of the earnings growth? And why it will come, we don't know. But it happens. It knocks the door and it comes. And at that time, you don't have a full portfolio. 
you will be just bypassed. You can't be timing the market. I want to move to the next thing, and that's the Q in, in your QGLP, quality, this whole concept, because we've been in an environment where we've seen a lot happen. We've seen companies, you know, go through the roof with leverage. We've seen IBC happen. We've seen promoter issues happen. We've seen auditor resignations happen. Now, how do you start defining the Q? What all goes in Q? What are your check marks? Yeah, so uh, Q is very clear, very commonsensical. You, I mean, we have uh, bifurcated into two, quality of business and quality of management. There are, there are three types of businesses, great, good, gruesome. So you have a very good business, you have good business, and you have outright bad business. 90% of businesses are outright bad businesses. So if you can cut out that bad businesses, I mean, the companies which either make losses or make the uh, profits less than cost of capital, I mean, 7%, 8%, and you know, there's all these so-called textile companies, types, you know, or sugar companies, even a lot of cement companies are also like that. So they don't make money, and they have the fancy names and kind of thing. These, if they don't make money, you're not going to make money, very clearly. And there are 80, 90% of the companies, they come in that category. Then you have the good companies, which earn about 80, 90%, like uh, all the well-run banking companies, finance companies, there is about 20. Then you have great companies like are they all well run? companies. Pardon? Are they all well run? The banking not and finance all, companies. Not all. Some of them. Some, are of them. Some of them. Then you have the you know wonderful companies like Asian Paints, Indusan Lever, Nestle. I mean, there are 25, 30 companies like that. They are great companies. If you can get great company at a reasonable price, you are done. I mean, you need four, five stocks like that. Your portfolio will do very well. But I try to make my entire portfolio of 15, 20 companies filled with good companies or one or two great companies. Mm. And I make sure that there is no dud company in my portfolio, no bad businesses. Okay. Eight, seven, eight percent return on equity businesses. Mm. I just hate to have uh, in my portfolios, and that's where people get stuck because they look very cheap, mm. but they're actually most expensive businesses.